right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan Raymond, and I'm with WCET. This is a wonderful webcast that we are proud to be in partnership with NW Heat on, and we'll tell you more about them as we move through. But if you're joining us for the first time, this is your first WCET event, do get online and check us out, learn more about what we do. Um, accessibility is one of our primary areas of interest. And uh, like I said, I lead membership programs at WCET and uh, we do a webcast about once a month. And so this is our featured webcast this week and we'll also be doing another one next week on regulatory landscape. So as we go through today, um, if you have any questions, enter them into the Q&A box. Often we get a lot of chatter and we love the discussion, but we may lose your question if it's in the chat. So participate in the chat, questions in the Q&A, and we'll get to those throughout the conversation. You can download the slides and then we will record this and share a link to the recording and any additional resources that were shared. Our speakers today are the incredible Kelly H. Duo. We have Kelly Herman with the University of Phoenix and Kelly Hoyland with One Ed Tech. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it to them. These are two tried and true experts that have participated in this similar discussion. Uh, they've collaborated on this rubric and they can tell you all about it. Uh, they'll be watching for questions as will I. So welcome everybody, let's get started. Hi everybody and thanks for joining us today. We're excited to share this work with you and share um, a great community resource that will really help everyone in this ecosystem. So with that, a little background, if you're not familiar with One Ed Tech, we used to be known as IMS Global Learning Consortium, so you might know us by that name. But what we are is a nonprofit member organization made up of a unique collaboration between K-12, higher ed, and the Ed Tech vendor partners who really participate in this community in a way that is focusing on creating an ecosystem that's open, trusted, and innovative. And we really see this as a way to look across boundaries, work together to really do what we need to for learners in this space. As we come together as a community, we usually represent a large portion of the stakeholders in the community, so we can really be a force multiplier in moving this work forward, especially in this accessibility area. So we do this through um, a number of different areas. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, we have areas around transformative digital learning, which is where our accessibility work sits right now, looking at making sure we create that digital learning environment that meets all learners' needs um, in many different ways. We also have uh, opportunities to make it open so that you can connect what you need to at what point, and also is innovative enough to allow you to create the environment that you're looking to for your learners. With that, um, I'll actually pass to my colleague, um, Kelly, who will talk a little bit more when we talk about accessibility and what we mean by that. Sure, thanks Kelly. And um, lucky for all of you that, you know, we we got two Kelly H's to share the stage here today. I love uh, getting to work with Kelly and and the um, work that we do through One Ed Tech. So as, as um, Megan mentioned, I'm Kelly Herman. I work for the University of Phoenix, but I also re work really closely with Kelly Hoyland and the, the team at One Ed Tech as I have been the, the chair of our accessibility task force. Um, and it's really important. My expertise is in accessibility. Um, it's been a lot of fun to be able to work with the other members of One Ed Tech and to have, you know, um, involvement from WCET and, and its members, you know, as well as we've, you know, worked on, you know, this rubric. But I wanted to make sure that we kind of set the stage, um, and especially because we know we have a lot of folks, you know, from NW Heat who's joining us as well, you know, today, um, for anyone who is not, you know, familiar with what accessibility is, let's just kind of start and make sure we're all talking about the same thing. So accessibility is when a person with a disability is afforded the opportunity to acquire the same information in game in the same interactions and enjoy the same services as a person without a disability and this is the really important part in an equally integrated manner with substantially equivalent ease of use and if you work at an institution of higher education have had any involvement with the office for civil rights um over the last you know a decade or more whereas they've you know um really engaged in digital accessibility and looking at what those of us are doing in higher education and in k-12 through 
12 to you know be able to provide inclusive and accessible um, learning environments for our students this is something you've seen this is something that you likely are familiar with if, if you do what i do for an institution and, and you're responsible for accessibility and accommodations some of those words were kind of scary because when this first started becoming um, something that we really were, were focused on back in 2009 with the very first Kindle lawsuits, um, these words we, we couldn't say that about the educational technology that was available then and the way that accessibility was not integrated into those products and tools. And so that really set us on a path here of being able to be able not only to define what accessibility is, but what it means for technologically you know, mediated instruction, both at the K through 12 level and at the higher education level. So we can go on to the next slide if you wouldn't mind. Um, as we you know start talking about accessibility we need to recognize that this is an institutional wide responsibility that we all have a role to play in the organizations that we work in to ensure that what we do is accessible for students and that's why accessibility vetting matters and so one thing that you'll hear me say often um, or if you've heard any sessions I've done before, this is a, a favorite of mine, is that accessibility is a journey. It is not a destination. This is something that I like to remind my colleagues of at, at the University of Phoenix. I remind our vendor partners of this. I remind you know the stakeholders that I get to talk to at various professional organizations, because I think sometimes we think, oh, if I just do X, Y, Z, then I'm gonna reach this nirvana place of accessibility and this isn't gonna be an issue anymore. And that's just not the case. It's not how technology works and it's certainly not how it works when someone has to use assistive technology tools to be able to access the things that you or I who don't have to use those tools might you know take for granted so when we talk about accessibility being a journey not a destination that means a few things it means that every time that we change a product you know that we're using any new releases has the opportunity to make accessibility better or it could make it worse and so we, we want to you know make sure that we're keeping tabs on that it also means that you know the way that in which students interact with the the technology can change students disabilities are not always static there you know th there is very ability and how that disability may affect them maybe sometimes hour to hour other times it might be day to day other times they might you know have longer periods of time where they're they are pretty stable and then you know something can change and so that's something that we want to you know be be mindful of as we're talking about this but this is why accessibility vetting is really important so we do accessibility vetting because we want to make sure that the that our students have equal access to the educational technology we're also trying to promote inclusivity and diversity in education and there's a there are a lot of sound bites out there around DEIB conversations right now, and I'm certainly not going to take us down that rabbit hole. But I want you to remember that when we're talking about aspects of inclusion and you know welcoming and belonging, that we are saying to our students, "You matter. We know you're here. We know that there are needs that you have, and we we knew that going into it, so we planned for it." And there is nothing that makes somebody feel more belong, like they belong as part of an organization or part of a community than having their needs met before they have to ask for it. And sometimes we get into this mindset of disability is all about an accommodation you know, um, perspective, that they have to ask for these things and then we have to provide it. There are things we know they're going to need and we should actually you know, approach it from more of a burial rem barrier removal aspect than you know waiting for them to ask for the accommodation and that's where a lot of this work you know um, is centered and then also what we've been trying to do with the accessibility task force through one ed tech is to share expertise among accessibility professionals and then ultimately influence the market the requirements to comply with section 504 and the ada are fully on the institution but the vendors and the suppliers have to create products that are going to help us do that and so therefore we have a responsibility to be able to say to them these are our requirements this is what we're expecting and then to be able to you know fully assess whether or not their product complies with those requirements and that then is going to help the vendors and the suppliers be able to integrate this into their product development cycles and to their roadmaps and so that's where all this work has been centered we can move on to the next slide Kelly, did you want to talk about this one? Yeah, I can talk about this. So how did this work actually come together? And I think this 
this last bullet point that uh, Kelly had mentioned before was the sharing of the expertise. I come out of both a K-12 and a higher ed background, um, out of organizations that did not have someone in Kelly's position who was there to help support the institution. I was in more of the academic tech realm trying to figure this out and I am not an accessibility professional and I still am not even after being involved in this work. Um, so I think that's the power of what this task force did is it brought together higher ed, K-12, and the vendor partners together to say, what is the information we're trying to get? What do we need to actually know to know where you fall on that accessibility journey? It's not a yes, no question. Are you accessible or not? It is a journey. It is going to change over time. And so we've heard from our vendors that say, we get all of these different forms with all of these different questions, sometimes asking questions that they aren't going to get the information they need and we want to be able to help them, but because of the procurement processes, they're limited in that way. So what this group came together, and this is just a sampling of some of the suppliers who were involved, not, not only them, as well as many of our higher education members and K-12, um, came together to say, okay, as we look at products, where do we want them to be? What are the questions we need to ask? Where are we trying to get information out of? And part of the power of the rubric is pulling that information into a central place. You know, I've had I've had instances where I've been working with a vendor where it would take me three months to get from the salesperson to the person who can actually answer the accessibility questions. So having that information kind of pulled together in a central place is even step one, which is really helpful for people. Um, but this rubric really took a, po a point to say, OK, where are they around accessibility policies and programs? Um, because both of those things take a uh, the impact in where you fall in that process. We know that they probably won't be 100% accessible. Have they thought about alternative access and alternative means to get there? Um, we have been graced by Kelly's great leadership in this group throughout the many years we've been working through this. Um, I, I'm excited to have us be at the point where we can actually start to talk about what this rubric is and have it available to the public. So on the next page, we'll talk a little bit more about the actual rubric itself. So we did leverage the expertise. So I would I was I'm thankful for Kelly from her perspective, as well as the many other institutional leaders, but also the supplier partners, their accessibility professionals were a part of this conversation, um, talking about how you can get the information you need to understand where they are. It provides that common framework for discussions. It's twofold, not only from the educational perspective where institutions are trying to understand where products are, but it also helps inform products where education institutions need them to be. So it's kind of a two-way conversation of here's what the market expects and would like us all to be at. Um, it is not a um, red, you know, gold, silver, bronze kind of rubric. You know, we're not grading them necessarily on where they are because we know it is a journey. This rubric will result in a place to give you an idea of how mature are they? How ready are they for these conversations? Because we know the market has very large suppliers who are able to really resource this work, but there are also many ed tech providers that are um, a dozen people on staff who don't have that expertise to really help them understand where they are going. It does not replace legislative requirements. This is not a legal review by any means or conformance documentation. Um, this is really a piece to guide your discussions and decisions, um, but not a legal advice by any means. Um, we are not lawyers and we do not play them on TV either. <laughs> Did I miss anything on that, Kelly? I don't think so. I think I think you got it all, especially that last part about, you know, it is not a, a substitution or, you know, in any way, shape or form, a, a rubber stamping that a, a tool is is going to meet a certain accessibility standard. And I know a lot of times folks want that, but there's a lot of components that go into a really effective accessibility evaluation. And, you know, it, it's it's not as simple as just looking at those standards and saying, yeah, this this meets it or no, this does not. So and I think that will become more clear as we share a little bit more about it. I think I covered a lot of this, but this is a lot of the non-technical aspects of accessibility too. I know we're called one ed tech and you think tech initially, but this is also things around policy and practices. So it's some of those decisions as well. Um, we talked about leveraging that accessibility expertise and pulling that information into a standard format for people, not only on the institution side to be able to understand where suppliers are, but for suppliers to provide that information in a consistent way. Um, to actually start the conversation. And it's really about building trust in that um, partnership. 
Yeah, and the one thing that I, I want to, you know, highlight on that, you know, last piece there, Kelly, is, you know, I think one of the strengths of our task force was that we did have so much, you know, active participation at different stage of the process, not only from educational institutions, but also from the supplier community. And I think sometimes we get set up a little bit as an us versus them. Like, you know, they they are the the, the bad entity that's selling product. They don't care about students. Got None of that's true, right? You know, but, you know, sometimes we kind of get this, you know, um, a dynamic where, you know, we on the institutional side feel like they're not listening to us, that, you know, they only care about making money. But the reality of it is, is that we're making demands of them too. And we had one of our supplier members, you know, who started this conversation with saying, this week alone, I got 15 different versions of a form that institutions asked me to fill out. And it's all asking for some, the same kind of information. And the amount of effort it takes to fill that form out, you know, 15 different times if if I could save some of that time and not have to complete those different versions of the form and we had something that folks could refer to, that's going to save me time and then allow me to spend my time on the, the activities that, that are going to move the needle at my company in terms of making, you know, accessibility a higher priority in our product development. And that resonated with us, you know, quite a bit and why we wanted to, you know, make sure that and why we constructed the rubric the way that we did. Perfect. All right. So am I taking this one, Kelly, or are you still on? Um, I can take this one if you want to take the next one. You so, got it. We've done this show so much, we don't know who does what anymore because we can I, talk for each other sometimes. Pretty much. <laughs> so just as a reminder of what this actual rubric is, and we'll show you more of the actual rubric um, as we get along. Um, at this point, it is a self-evaluation by a supplier. We went back and forth in task force about self-evaluation by supplier, institutional evaluation of that supplier, um, having lots of pros and cons conversations. Where we landed was this is a self-evaluation because a supplier should have some expertise and knowledge about where this information lives. Sometimes institutions are struggling to find this information and we wouldn't want them to uh, complete a re uh, review that was inaccurate too. Um, so this allows them to cre create that self-evaluation, judge themselves, publish that, um, but before it gets published, our task force actually is going to do a, a review of it to make sure that it's actually accurate and thorough. We want to make sure that the information that gets published is helpful. The supplier wants the same thing. So in, in our past experiences with other similar projects, suppliers are honest. Sometimes they're even harder on themselves than they need to be um, because they do want to make sure that you have the right information. Um, this does help uh, member organizations manage their accessibility vetting process. This can be step one. Um, I like to say it's a great way to say, is it worth the rest of my time? Those, accessible, those full accessibility re reviews are resource intensive. And sometimes you have a great um, stakeholder on campus that says, we really need this tool. And you're like, but we already have something on campus that does something similar. Do we really need it? If you can do this quick check with accessibility and go, oh, it's going to take us a while to get through this process with this vendor. It gives you that kind of knowledge to be able to, to have that conversation without expending too many resources. It also encourages our suppliers to develop their accessibility. We all would love all of our vendor partners to move in this direction. This gives them some goalposts to move towards. Um, and ultimately, this is for learners. We want learners to have the most accessible ed tech tools. So that's what the rubric is about. Yeah, and Kelly, before we move on to the next slide, um, we have a, a question from Christy in the in the Q and A that I, I want to um, talk about here, just because I think it, it's relevant to what we were just speaking about. So Christy asks, is there legal standing for higher ed admins to enforce accessibility with ed tech vendors regarding disallowing faculty um, use uh, to use any um, technology that are not vetted? And so Christy, I think that's a really good question, um, and you know, it's one that we grapple with, and uh, from an institutional perspective perspective all the time. Like, you know, there, there are various different requirements that we have as those of us who work in administration in, especially in higher education. And as I mentioned earlier, the requirements to comply with ADA and 504 fall on the institution. And so what you can or cannot, you know, force members of your community. And so when I say members of the community, I'm talking about every member of your community that, you know, from faculty to staff, to your students, and to the suppliers that you engage with and that you partner with as you use their products, it's going to look a little bit differently. So, you know, at, and I can speak, you know, to how I have done this at the university 
University of Phoenix, we have an accessibility policy and our accessibility policy, you know, has different requirements for the different, you know, um, standing you might have at the institution. So for our faculty, there are things that we tell our faculty when they're sharing content with students, they must do. So for instance, if they're sharing an image with their students in an online course, that image must have alternative text descriptions. If they're posting a hyperlink in a discussion forum, those hyperlinks must be descriptive. You can't just post the long URL. And things like that, you know, that are simple steps that our faculty can be able to do regardless of their accessibility expertise. We train them, we provide resources, and we tell them and we evaluate them on whether or not they're using those tools. So that's how our faculty, we handle the faculty. Our policy also says that every product that we procure or that we develop must meet the university's accessibility standards. And we've adopted the, the web content accessibility guidelines, you know, um, that the WCAG, you may hear, hear referred to that way, um, from the W3C. And, you know, so therefore, when we start to go down a procurement pathway, we do say to vendors, it's part of our requirements that you must meet the WCAG standards, and we are going to evaluate your, your product and your tool. Now, when we do that, there are lots of different things, you know, that happen, you know, as part of that evaluation. Evaluation. I, can, I saw Petra's uh, comment in the chat that, you know, they're requesting accessibility compliance reports. That, that's, that's a great, you know, first step. We do that as well. But we also will sit down and do a full evaluation of a tool, especially a tool that's being used um, with our students, because we have a responsibility to ensure that that, that tool is accessible. And if it does not meet the accessibility standards, we must have an equally effective alternative access plan in place for the use of that tool. And that all has happens through the procurement process. So as part of that, procurement's a really important partner for me and my team, as are in, our instructional designers. All of our courses are designed by instructional designers, and it's a centrally, you know, um, a design curriculum that our faculty then facilitate. That offers me some, you know, different options in the process than those of you who might be at an institution that does not take that approach, and faculty are able to, you know, uh, design courses as they see fit. So we have it as a requirement, you know, that those things must be accessible, it must pass you know, and, and be approved by my team in order to be able to use, be used, or we have to have a documented exception on, on file that is actually approved by our provost who I report to. So those are some of the things that, that we put in place and our vendors know this. I actually, this, this morning, I just came from a meeting with a vendor where we had to have some difficult conversations about some of the accessibility challenges and what was going to happen with, you know, our potential um, ability to purchase more of their product if they're not able, you know, to work with us and, you know, be able to make their, their products more accessible. Those are difficult conversations to have, but they're important conversations to have. And I also happen to have oversight of our accommodations team. So I know how many students I have in my classes, for the most part, who are using accommodations. We still have students who don't disclose and are, you know, in our classes and using tool, you know, the, the, their tools without telling us. And those, those are, you know, things and that's data that we use to inform our decision making around this. So in terms of where you have that authority, you know, to do those things, a lot of it is going to be dependent upon your organizational structure, what your policy says. If you're at an institution where you have tenure track faculty and you have faculty governance, that's going to be a really important body that you're going to need to work with, raise awareness of this issue and get their buy-in on this and why this is important to students. Um, and likewise, even though I don't have tenure track faculty at the University of Phoenix, all of our faculty faculty are, you know, associate facu faculty, um, I still have to have the faculty buy-in because if the faculty don't buy into this and understand why this is important, it's going to affect the experience that our students have. So even though I have a few levers that I can push differently than I did when I worked as uh, one of the um, SUNY institutions back in New York, I'm still taking the same tactics, you know, and trying to raise awareness around this and to make it less about the, the legal compliance and more about this is who our students are and this is what they need. And let's make sure that, that we're, we're doing the right thing so that our students feel like they are welcomed and they have access to our curriculum because what we want to teach them is important. So why why wouldn't we want them to have access to it? So I wanted to just, you know, um, jump in and, and get that question answered. And I know there's some more things um, that are coming up in the chat. So as we move on to the next um, slides, we'll try to get to those as well. 
All right, this one's me. Um, so we just um, mentioned, you know, that there are some, you know, different, you know, forms and, um, you know, uh, tools that are out there so that we can be able to, you know, understand from the supplier's perspective how they've integrated accessibility into their tools. And so these are things that you may be hearing about. And so I think one of the ones that most of us are familiar with when you start to kind of get adjacent to accessibility work, this becomes one of the alphabet soups that you learn how, how to say, whether even if you don't necessarily always understand what it is, but the VPAT is um, the Voluntary Product Accessibility Template, and that is a form that is, um, you know, used by vendors, particularly if they are, need to comply with Section 508 of the um, Rehabilitation Act, which re is related to procurement by the federal government. And so the 508 standards are a little bit different than um, what the, the WCAG standards are. There is some consistency, but it's not, you know, wholly consistent, but the VPAT is that template that gets filled out. Once it gets filled out, it is called then an accessibility conformance report or the ACR. And that actually is when the, the vendor has completed that to show how they do or do not meet the, those 508 standards. And even though we, uh, in most cases in higher education and in, in K through 12, we don't have to, you know, abide by the 508 standards because it does only apply to um, the activities of the federal government. Many states have adopted 508 standards as state law, so you might have to, you know, um, abide by this as part of your institutional policy. And you know, you'll have to look that out and, and you know, determine that for yourself. But once the the VPAT has been completed, it is called an accessibility conformance report. The one accessibility, one, one accessibility rubric, I, I'm combining all the words here now, Kelly. Um, the one EdTech accessibility rubric is meant to supplement that information. And so it's a common framework for discussions with suppliers about their accessibility practices. We are not trying to recreate those standards. We're not trying to, you know, as, you know, usurp any place that the 508 guidelines or the WCAG guidelines have in, in, in terms of how we look at digital accessibility. That would be a waste of our time and effort, quite frankly, because those are the gold standards. What we're trying to do here is to fill in some of the other things. So when we were working on this, those of us on the task force, we're trying to think about the times that we have been called upon to be references for our, our supplier partners and to think about what kinds of questions we ask of references and what we have been asked as references so that we can be able to help you know our supplier partners think about how to showcase their commitment to accessibility and how they are approaching accessibility as an organization and so it is you know um, different and as we mentioned before it is not meant to say this is compliant or you know this is you know going to legally protect you it's just one more piece of the puzzle and then EDUCAUSE also has the HECVAT, um, and it is a framework designed to measure vendor risk associated with PII. And so it does have a small section on accessibility. And one of the things that was really important for us to do as part of our development of the accessibility rubric was to crosswalk between all of these various vetting measures that are out there and to look at how we complement each other, because that was our goal. Our goal was not to take the place of one thing or another, but rather to provide additional complementary and supplemental information that could help you round out a full picture of how that supplier is, you know, a, approaching accessibility and whether that was someone that you wanted to engage in a partnership with. So I think we can move on to the next slide. I'm not seeing any new questions in our Q&A and we'll get to the chat in a, in a few minutes. Um, and so we have four different categories, you know, that we put together here with the rubric. And just a note on the QR code that's on this slide. Um, as we've been sharing the slides, you know, we, we've done a little bit of testing and, and it doesn't look like the, the um, QR code is working, but Kim did just put the link to the rubric in the chat. So please use that link and, and don't try to scan the QR code. Um, and then you can see what the, the rubric, uh, you know, looks like itself. But there are four, the four categories are information and documentation. So, um, you know, Things like what sort of documentation do you have available? Did you, and you know, you can see as you know, you look at the various prompts as you look at the rubric, how we kind of broke that down. The procurement process and communication was an important category for us to talk through because we wanted to know things like were the um, suppliers, you know, representatives able to demonstrate, you know, for you the accessibility features of the actual tool? Was that something that they were able to do? Um, you know, in the first section in, in information and documentation, one of the, the important 
important things was, do they have an accessibility statement? Because again, these are things that maybe don't necessarily influence the technical accessibility you might find in the product, but it's going to give you a lot of insight into how they are committed to this and what and what they're thinking about it. The accessibility conformance section of the rubric, you know, asks things like, you know, have you had, um, you know, a third party helping you to figure out how you conform with it? These are, you know, so we're not asking how you conform necessarily or, you know, going through, you know, the, the various poor, you know, criteria, if you're familiar with WCAG and how they, they organize the criteria, that wasn't something we wanted to do, but we rather wanted to look at things like, are you building accessibility into your product roadmap? You know, do you have a separate, um, you know, accessibility team that we can be able to contact, you know, for support or other, you know, concerns? Um, you know, so things like that, things that are going to help you to round out and to say, what is this experience going to be like if I am, you know, working with this particular vendor and I have a student because students are are not the same, right? I can have two blind students sitting in front of me and th those two students are going to have very, very different experiences based on number one, their blindness skills and their technology skills. And I can have one who will be able to go through and do everything on their own independently and never need to tell my accommodations team that they exist. And then I can have another student who can't get through a Word document because they are newly blind and are still learning how to use the assistive technology. This tool that I'm procuring has to work for both of those students and we have to be able to support them and that's where you know the alternative and accommodation um, section also comes into play with the rubric because we want you know to know has the vendor under do they understand where their product may not meet accessibility standards and where there might be issues and have they thought about alternatives because sometimes the vendor is the the most appropriate person to help us figure out what that a, a alternative access plan might look like because they know what their product has been designed to do and what learning objectives it's designed to help us meet and so I have, you know, experiences with, you know, vendors over the years where the best ideas for accommodations actually came from the product team that developed it. And, you know, we were able to work together to be able to put that as our exception, you know, plan in place so that when we had a student, our classes are only five weeks long. When we had a student who told us they were having difficulty, we had something ready to go. And so those are important considerations and that's what the rubric looks like. I think we can move on to the next slide, unless Kelly, there was something you wanted to ask, add here. You're good. Okay. Okay. Do you want to take this? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do you want me to keep okay. going? I'll do this one so you can take a break. Um, so as we talked about in the scale, in the in the scoring earlier, we are not looking at you know meets does not meets. It's really about emerging, advancing, or optimized performance. So when you look at the rubric, you'll be able to see that there is still you know kind of the look and feel of a rubric, and it's about this is how it is actually scored. So in the emerging area, they're going to get you know kind of zero points for that. Um, advancing gives them one and then um, optimized gives them two. And so then overall their final score, um, if they're 22 or above, because this is a maturity model, will end up in that optimized category. So you'll be able to see some of that. It might, there's always room to be improving. So even if somebody isn't that optimized, they're going to continue to work towards that. But it really does help guide um, vendors to where you want them to be and gives them an option. You know, if, the, if they're an emerging company in general, if they're at least emerging their accessibility, that is great. So that's kind of how that uh, maturity scoring goes. On the next slide, I think we covered a little bit about this already, but in practice, what does this look like? The suppliers complete that self-evaluation. Um, one attack does that quality assurance check. The, tr the task force will also do that, especially for this first year to make sure that it's being implemented correctly. Um, once those are published, so even after that point, um, our members who are reviewing the published um, score, you know, rubrics, will have the opportunity to provide feedback. So it might be that they're seeing something different than what the rubric is showing. So maybe they said they have this accessibility testing, but they're not seeing that in place, or they're not seeing this process or, or program happening. So there's a way to change that feedback. And part of it might be that the product has updated since it was last completed, but this gives an opportunity to make sure that those um, self-evaluations, there is kind of a, a, a check for members to be able to provide that feedback if there's any questions. Um, so that is available to um, any of our member, institutions are able to see those actual submissions. The rubric is available for everybody, um, but we'll talk more about some of that. 
In addition, um, we are not looking to do this on our own. So um, on the next slide, we talked a little bit about some of the partnerships and collaborations that we've already talked to or are in process of. Um, we would like the community as a whole to work across this area. We, we do not want to do it on our own. Um, the more people who are working together in the same direction work. So we've had some conversations with EDUCAUSE, the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, um, CAST or cities, depending on how you look at them, as well as Teach Access. So these are all ones that we've looked at. We continue to look at others. A part of this webinar is our outreach to other groups like WCET. Um, so if there are others, you're like, hey, we really should be talking with this group too. We're happy to have those conversations. And then I think lastly, before we jump into kind of questions, so what can you actually do? So the rubric is posted. I know the link has been shared in chat. It's also linked here. Um, the rubric is publicly available to anyone. Um, the completed rubric. So if a vendor has completed their rubric right now, that is only available to one EdTech members. Um, at the bottom of the slide, you might not know if you are a member or not. Many of you are. In some cases, there's system-wide memberships that once you get down to an individual campus level or an accessibility office, you might not even know you're a member. Um, that link is there for you to be able to check that out, as well as thank you for putting it in the chat. Um, if you want to learn about membership, that link is there. Um, but what else can you be doing? So you can be encouraging your suppliers to complete this rubric. So even if you're not a member, um, you can have them look at this rubric and send it to you via email, via PDF, whatever you want. So you can still leverage this resource and have them answer these questions in the same way. If you are a member, please have them submit it through the process so that it can be published to others because that's the other benefit of this is once it's done once, they don't, we don't have to do it again and again and again. So that's the other power of this because we don't want you know, a vendor to have to do the same form 30 times um, or have to be asked 30 times to do it if it's already there. If University of Phoenix has already asked them to do it, it's there, you don't even have to take that step. Um, so that's kind of what you can do at this point. Kelly, remind me if I missed anything else, but. No, I think you got it all. Okay. So I, I was gonna just scan. If there's questions, the Q&A is open. Yep. Um, any others that we didn't already hit? We, we do actually have three questions um, in, in the Q&A um, box now. And the first one is from Liz. And she asked if we could send out a copy of the image of the completed sample rubric. She clicked the link that was shared, but having trouble actually finding the actual rubric. And, um, and you know, Megan or Kim, if you could post the link again um, for folks to be able to download the slides, I think um, you could be able to get that, that image, you know, through being able to download the slides, Liz. And I think Megan is typing an answer to you right now as we speak. So um, you should be be able to have that. The next question um, is from James. Um, James said, why is an accessibility designed and built into products with the accountability on manufacturers, not on educational institutions? Educational institutions buy and use automobiles, but they are not required by law to design and make systems to address manufacturing shortcomings. Some of these accessibility products are excessively expensive. And uh, amen to that last statement. Yes, you know, they are quite expensive. And um, you know, the, the best answer that I have, you know, to, to the main question um, that you are posing is because the, the way that Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and the way that the Americans with Disabilities Act has been written, specifically as they relate to, you know, the use of educational technology and the way that, um, you know, we, you know, um, provide accommodations, you know, to students, is it's all tied to our, you know, standing as an institution as a recipient of federal funds. So when we accept federal financial aid, we are, you know, required to um, meet the, you know, the, the mandates of, you know, those two laws and their civil rights laws and you know there there's different components and I'm not I'm not an attorney I often joke that I, I play one on TV um, but only as it relates to ADA 504 and sometimes FERPA in uh, limited <laughs> instances but you know the reality of it is is that you know the the way that they the um, Congress when when they chose to to write these laws were really focused on the educational institutions and the access to the educational institutions and quite frankly you know section 504 was written in 1970 regulations were written in 1978 for 504 the ADA was written and passed in 1990 
And the, a lot of the, the technology that we use in educational institutions now was not there then, and we were not using it in the same way. And so the laws don't keep up and they don't keep pace with, you know, the way that education moves. And so when you look at, you know, what measures you have in place to kind of force the hand of the supplier community that you're, you're working with, the, the way that you force their hand is by, is by your purchasing dollars. And I don't necessarily think that I, that I would anticipate that you'll see a change in that soon. Um, you know, there is, you know, some, you know, you know, free market, you know, expectations here and, you know, the way that, you know, our, our, our society and our economy is based, it is based on, you know, Know, supply and demand and when we demand these things then you know the suppliers have to be able to meet those demands and that's probably the the most effective lever that you can be able to push in terms of controlling the market and informing the market of what they need to be asking for and I, I've done this a long time I've, I've been in accommodations and disability services for 25 years I've seen you know a lot of these changes I've been working you know in um, you know more technology mediated areas of higher education since 2005 so I've seen seen a, a huge shift and where the conversations that I was having initially in 2005, 2006, 2007, leading into those Kindle lawsuits with suppliers was more about um, don't forget we have disabled students and you have to think about accessibility and their thought about accessibility was well it's available to everybody and it's and nobody knew what that word meant and having to do a lot of education around what these needs were and that there were assistive technology tools that you know students needed to use to access you know the computer now there's more familiarity with that and now you're getting to deeper conversations about how should you be integrating this into the design of your product what are some of the issues that our students are facing how are you know things that maybe are mediated by AI and how those you know tools have come onto the market that a lot of times were started because they fulfilled an access need for for the disabled community now are things that we use in in our everyday lives and you know and so there's been a lot of change and so I think I'm kind of on a soapbox here a little bit, James, and, and so I hope everybody's bearing with me a little bit here, but the reality of it is, is that, you know, the the where the federal government had the most influence was over the institutions, and that therefore then could be able to influence the market. So I don't anticipate that it will change, but I do anticipate, you know, that our suppliers are getting much more sophisticated about this. They are more committed, you know, to this, and, and that's, you know, speaking from personal experience and, and the conversations that have changed even just in the seven years that I've been at the university. University of Phoenix, and I think that's a good thing. Um, so the um, other uh, comment that James made in the Q&A was that um, we have R&D captioning over the past several years and working with vendors, but it's not 100% and it really does not meet the standards or the law. And I think, um, you know, the the stance on captioning and using, you know, captioning that is AI mediated, it, it depends on what your purpose is and that, you know, technology has improved considerably. I think it's a great example of technology that has, you know, improved and has made access in some ways easier for some folks who have communication, you know, needs where they cannot hear what is being said. But yet when you're looking at the effective communication clause of the ADA, it doesn't meet that standard because it isn't always accurate. And so, you know, those are, are the times when we as institutions have a responsibility and it's not just for folks who sit in the seat that I sit in, right? My responsibility for my institution is around our diverse student population, not just, you know, students who come from different races and ethnicities and, and you know, those sorts of backgrounds, but also our disabled students. And one of the things that is important for me is, you know, to be able to advocate for that and to really talk about when it is that you need to hire someone to come in and do real-time captions versus relying on AI captions. And, you know, what, what are the ways that you need to to use those, you have to have a strategy around that. So my, my answer to that is having conversations at your institution about what your activities are and what you know the end result of those activities are in terms of what outcome you're looking for, what objective you're trying to meet. And if it is around communication, then yeah, you you got to you know contract with a, a, an agency that's going to provide real-time captions that are going to be 99% accurate and you know not rely on something that is AI mediated and is likely going to not be as accurate accurate as it could be because you want to ensure that that you know communication is effective and i think that those are the conversations we have to have and 
at each stage of the game in terms of looking at our strategy around access and communication and inclusion on our in, uh, on our campuses or at, at our organizations because it's really important you know to be able to understand what is the purpose for that activity and therefore you make your accommodation decisions you know related to that all right, um, last question from Anonymous um, is, do you have any thoughts or suggestions on academic content and accessibility? For example, syllabi, readings, et cetera. And Anonymous, I'm going to assume that you are talking about um, the, the content that faculty, you know, could potentially share, um, you know, and, you know, how we approach those. And so I'll just hearken back to, um, you know, the policy that we have here at the University of Phoenix and, and the expectation that we have for our faculty is that when they're sharing content with students, it must be accessible. And so that that falls into a couple of different, you know, ways that that we approach that. And so number one, the most important, you know, part of our strategy is that we need to provide resources to our faculty so that they can create and share accessible content. So that means that we, we do trainings with them regularly. We have a faculty resource center and a section of that is related to accessibility that has, you know, resources that they can access and, and any time you know that they need it and be able to you know get support um the other piece is that actual support you know so not only working with my team if they have questions about their content they can reach out to my digital accessibility team or they can you know reach out to our faculty support team who also have some basic information and knowledge and expertise around how to create accessible content but we also make it really clear for them what what it means to have accessible content. So we we have taught them how to evaluate websites, you know, to look for things like color contrast and nav keyboard navigation, simple things. You know, obviously they're not going to sit down and do a full accessibility evaluation. We would never expect that. But if you are writing a um, Word document, there are simple things that you can do in the authoring of that document that's going to make that document more accessible and we teach them how to do that and we expect them to do that. Um, so there are, you know, things that we do um, in terms of, of that content, anything related to what goes into our curriculum, you know, from our centrally designed, um, you know, classroom is, is accessible. You know, my team does a full evaluation on that content so that when the faculty step into their, their course section that they're going to be facilitating, they're starting from an accessible section. Um, and they are just responsible for the content that they choose to share with students. And as I mentioned before, we ask them to share des um, descriptive hyperlinks. We teach them how to do that. We ask them to ensure images have alternative text descriptions, and we we've taught them how to do that. Um, a lot of our faculty are using videos for instructor presence, and we've taught them how to make those accessible and how to you know cre create those videos from a usability perspective as well to make sure that the the person who's watching that video has a good you know um, experience watching the video um, and then also you know we ask that they share accessible PDFs and we've taught them how to check for those and then we also ask that anything that they post um, have captions and transcripts so those are the things that you know that we do um, you know with our faculty in terms of you know content that gets shared in the classroom and, and I'm just going to add one thing when yeah. I think about trying to get buy-in on that accessibility. Um, it's yeah. probably, if, if you live in the academic tech realm or, or technology procurement realm, you know there are similar conversations around privacy and security as well. Accessibility should be a part of that same conversation. So if you can leverage the conversations that are happening around any of those other topics on your campus, this is another one that it's just as legally binding, it's just as you know risk mitigation as you would on that security side, which they seem to sometimes get the spotlight, not always, but sometimes it's a good way to do that. Um, and I would just also clarify in the chat, there was questions about how to see the actual rubric on the first link that was shared. So under the public resources, um, it is published as one of our official specifications. Um, so it is in that specification area under Appendix A. If you have questions, um, I think we'll share our emails. We're happy to share that as well, too. Yeah, absolutely. And Kelly, we've got one last um, question from another anonymous attendee. Um, who do you suggest we start with to get buy-in for enforcing accessibility in courses and with vendors like your process at the University of Phoenix? Um, as a, this is a great question. Um, and, you know, 
and I've done this with this work at a couple of different institutions. So I have different institutional contexts, you know, in my experience and, you know, have had to take, you know, slightly different, you know, um, use different strategies at each one of those institutions. So the first thing that I'm going to tell you is that you really need to understand your own institutional context and who the folks are that you need to have on your team. And so when I first got here to Phoenix um, and, um, you know, Megan just, you know, or, or Kim, one of them just switched to our, our final slide that has our email address addresses, um, you know, um, so, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, but, you know, the first thing that I had to do when I when I got here seven years ago was, um, number one, I needed to understand why it was that they created my position, which was, you know, the first, I'm um, the first person to occupy this position. It was the first time the university had a VP level position that was devoted to accessibility. And I needed to figure out what problem they were trying to solve. And at that point in time, we had just come through an, an investigation with the Office for Civil rights based on a student complaint. There were findings related to the um, uh, the accessibility of our digital content. So for me, you know, I had a list of stakeholders that I needed to engage with. And my list of stakeholders included uh, the folks who were responsible for our website because there were issues with our website. So I had to reach out to our marketing team. We have a lot, we had a lot of resources that we used and developed internally at the University of Phoenix. Um, and so I needed to engage with our IT team to make sure that I understood what their process was of development, just similar to what I do with a vendor now. Then I also had to look at our curriculum and instructional design group, and I needed to understand how they worked with my academic colleagues in the, in, under the provost organization to design our courses and to find out where decisions got made. Um, and then I had to look at when we purchased things, what, what was our procurement process and what was our procurement policy and where, you know, where did we have to insert, you know, checks and balances into the system them so that we could be sure that we were catching things as it was coming through. And so it's going to vary institution to institution. If you already have a policy on the books, that's going to be a, a great place to start. If you have more of a physical plant that you need to be responsible for students engaging with at a more traditional campus, you're going to need to have your facilities people and your security folks are going to have to be more involved than they might have been in, in my journey here at the University of Phoenix. But you know what we started with was an accessibility committee. We got these stakeholders to come together, sit around a table, and you know some of it was very cathartic. So for them, it was a little stressful for me, but it was pretty cathartic for them where they were able to kind of air their grievances about what had happened in the aftermath of, of the investigation and where they felt like they had no choice and things were being shoved down their throat. And that that is the, the approach that I think does not work. If you rely too heavily on referencing the law and compliance and not in, um, as much on talking about your students and who your students are, you're going to lose your, your partners around the table. We all need to be invested in this from a, a common you know, starting point. And your common starting point, what you're all there to do is to provide, and assuming you're all at educational institutions, is your student. And so we use that as our common starting ground to say, what is our student's journey? And what is it that we need to do to ensure that they have an equitable journey to get their degrees? Um, we already know that the university um, serves an adult learner-focused institution. Um, you know, or a population rather, adult learners, they're notoriously high risk. You, you, they have multiple competing priorities, and school is not always at the top of that list. The other piece is, is that you know, students who have disabilities are also at higher risk for persistence and retention issues. So we had a double whammy there, and we needed to make sure that we all understood who these students were and why it was that we were doing these things, and to make it into smaller, more digestible chunks. There's, you know, the old saying that you can eat an elephant but you got to do it one bite at a time. That's really important. You know, we needed to make sure that we were keeping our eye on the whole prize, but really focusing on what was realistic for us to do and what was the timeline that we needed to be able to do it in. We had some external pressures because we had a compliance, you know, action where we had to meet certain deliverables, you know, from the Office for Civil Rights, but that didn't change the approach that we were taking. And it was very rare that I was talking about that resolution agreement in those meetings because I needed to get there them to buy into what it was that was really important, which was making sure that we had access for our students. So my advice on that is nine times out of 10, 
procurement is probably going to be the place for you to start because it's going to be one of the easier places where you can insert it, get some success, get some folks who um, you know are willing to become allies with you in the fight and are willing to talk about what it is that you're doing, um, and you know have you know some good outcomes that you can look for, and then start to branch out to other places. Um, the other place, if you're at a more traditionally focused institution, I would start with the faculty. The faculty need to understand, and you need to enlist students who are willing to share their stories, whether that's you sharing the, their stories and understand so that they can start to understand what the journey looks like from the student's perspective. There, there is no greater teacher than that. Um, and then, you know, be able to branch out from there because then you get other people talking about it. And the most effective strategy that I have is that I'm not the one who talks about accessibility the most at this institution. It's all of the other colleagues that I have and, and who we've worked with who will be in other meetings and say, uh, did you talk to Kelly Herman or her team? You, you need Rob in this meeting or you need Janet in this meeting and I don't even have to do it anymore um you know so don't tell everyone at the university that um that's my own little secret you know um my, my secret level or lever that I pull but it's so important because it is an institutional responsibility it's not just the responsibility of my team and you know we got that buy-in so I hope that helps I know I, I kind of ranted here a little bit um and rambled but um hopefully there were some good nuggets there Kelly and Kelly, thank you so much. Thank you for your work on this rubric. It does certainly fill a critical need in the marketplace. So we really appreciate your work on this. I know it was several years in the making. So thank you. I think it's really going to be valuable to the community. Um, we just have a few slides to go through here. So please stay tuned. Um, we will be sharing the link to the slides with the updated link for the rubric, a link to the recording, and any other resources that were shared. You can learn more about WCET and our work, and if you're not a member, consider joining us. Our partner in this webinar was NW Heat, and you can learn more about them at that link, Northwestern Higher Education Accessibility Technology Group. They've been a wonderful collaborator. And we have a very busy spring ahead here at WCET, so stay tuned. You're not going to want to miss some of these upcoming things. Lots and lots happening with the Department of Education. We're going to have a webinar on March 20th to go over some of the proposed rules, and you can ask your questions of our policy experts. AI Ethics, Governance, Policy, and Practice in Higher Education, that's a webcast that is also free and open to everybody. Then, if you really want to dive into the landscape of the new regulations, you can join us in St. Louis, July 30th to 31st. We'll have a day and a half workshop there. And we are accepting proposals from anybody that is interested in submitting for our annual meeting, which will be in Long Beach, California this year. You can submit a full proposal, or if you just have good ideas and you want us to help flesh that out with some other panelists, you can just submit an idea. Lastly, I want to thank our WCET sponsors. We really rely on them to help us underwrite much of what we do so that we can make our events free and open and our supporting members. So thank you everybody. Thank you for your great questions and engagement. And thank you to the two Kelly H's for being here and thank you to NW Heat. Bye everyone, take care. <laughs>